I think this is a real opportunity for us to think about some of the ways that we can tell stories better and talk to some of these people around some of the ways that they've seen the kind of online storytelling that we want to do being done as well as possible. Our company's been working in diversity and inclusion in sport and the arts since 2004 and our biggest sport project so far was the Asian Cup. We did the fan engagement for the Asian Cup. So what did the Asian Cup give us? It gave us an opportunity to showcase Iranian female football fans to the world and make a statement to Iran and possibly embarrass them about the fact that they're um, putting their hand up to host Asian Cups and major events, but women still can't get into stadiums. So YouTube, what we really loved about this was it was the men that stepped up um, and the local Iranian men um, went out of their way to make sure um, every woman available could attend and every family could attend. So the Iranian women came to party, it was massive, 17,000 people came out in Melbourne, 22,000 people came out in Sydney and 15,000 came out in Brisbane. The Iranian women also came to protest, so some banners mysteriously came out at certain stages. We will be in all games, all stadiums and they took selfies as well. Iran censors images of Iranian and Australian women at the Asian Cup but they couldn't block Instagram and people were just working different channels. So where did this move to? A key influencer call to action. It could be FIFA boss Sepp Blatter's greatest moment and his biggest legacy. So he called out, urged Iran to allow women at stadiums. And it's on CNN, Al Jazeera, it was an all points bulletin. By then the story had a huge life of its own. It's time to win a band on, on women on matches, Sepp Blatter tells Iran. Let, a women, let Iranian women go to the stadiums. These are all images from the, the Asian Cup in Australia which led to change four months later in April this year. But just from January, uh, four months later, women are now allowed in the stadiums in Iran. Moral of the story, community stories can bring powerful change. Thanks for censoring us. That's the story. Thank you very much. And what are the lessons that people should be taking on board in how they connect with and engage with people in an online format? Look, I think um, just further what these guys are saying, that what, what we find actually resonates the most is authenticity. So as long as you actually you actually have the people out there who are affected by the story or or know the story best, that's what that's what really gets cut through. Um, from what we see on Twitter, in terms of what works, and when I say what works, I mean in terms of what get what get retweeted, what gets favourited, and what not. Um, you know, video things with video and um, photos in them are up to three or four times more likely to get retweeted than um, a tweet that may just be the 140 characters of text being really clear in your um, in your communications what your objections are rather than just rather than just ranting um, and you know making sure that you actually have a bit of a measured voice that's considered but also have a look at what other people are saying as well and um, you know really take 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 your reaction in in terms of that we don't always have positive stories to tell how do we find ways of engaging with people that are that are getting our messages out and that are delivering some kind of real world outcome uh, in a way that's genuine and doesn't do harm to the people that we're talking about. We know that audiences, you know, are starting to filter out these more, you know, these sadder, um, you know, more negative stories. So we have to find a way to reframe them in a more positive way so that people will actually respond and engage with them. Um, and one of the ways that we kind of approach that is using um, this idea of, you know, the hero's journey, which is, you know, a narrative trope that's been told through generation and generation over again. But now I feel like it's even more meaningful. So the hero's journey is basically the idea that, um, um, you know, there's uh, the hero of a story. They start out in these humble beginnings, like you're saying. They go through a struggle and they, you know, at the other side of this struggle, they come out enlightened. There's a better world ahead of them. Um, now we have the opportunity to make the audience the hero in this story. So we do still get the opportunity to tell the realities of these really difficult stories that we are dealing with. But we put the audience at the centre of that journey and we give them the opportunity to get involved and create change and to make that story a positive one. And now we have more ways than ever through different digital mediums to actually put that audience at the centre of the story through things like, uh, you know, asking people to get behind a crowdfunding campaign, asking people to volunteer. So you're uh, giving them the opportunity to turn a negative story into a positive one and you are kind of shining that light at the end of the tunnel through the work that your organisation is doing. I was going to say, I think the other thing is that there's so many um, organisations now competing for people's attention, competing for people's money, competing for people's time is I think you need to actually show people the difference that they're making. So the social good that's, that's coming of their, of you know, them donating some cash or them actually spending some time with, with your organisation. And, you know, I think what, what the online space does is it makes it really easy to do that. 
So, you know, when you're, um, you know, if you um, are capturing people's details or when someone makes a donation, um, you know, get their, get their Facebook page or get their Twitter, get their Twitter handle and um, take a bit of time to send them a thank you or to let them know the difference that, they're, um, that their donation's made. How do we make sure that we've got those right voices, those right people who know what they're talking about, who can tell you about their direct experience of whatever the social issue that we happen to be focused on that day is? Audiences are often multi-tiered, um, and I think if you work through, you look at your organisation, your staff should be the best storytellers. They should have their Obama 30-second story, Obama in the lift, or hopefully Hillary in the lift, 30-second uh, story ready and be able to... I'm amazed how many people don't have um, either an elevator pitch about what they do or, um, you know, the story of our non-profit you can clearly see through John. Um, John started, and, and, and just to articulate all your services through that, um, your donor stories or your board stories are absolutely massive because you've often got successful people giving up their time and telling their story can oft, oft, often twig because it's a bit of an inexact science. Sometimes you, know what, you don't know what part of the story or whose story is going to hit. And if you have a single story from a single person, single narrative, there's a chance you're missing out on. Um, you want to hear it from as diverse range of voices as possible and you find that in your staff, you'll find that in the people you're serving and you'll find that in your board or donors or anyone else that's become interested in what you're doing. I guess just to add to that um, a bit more, um, just to give you a bit of background, I come from a background of working with a social impact crowdfunding platform, Start Some Good for two years, and when we talk about getting stories out there um, and you know reaching your audience, we always talk about it in um, Seth Godin's models of, model of you, know, you work with your peers, your tribes, and then the crowds. So often when we try and get these voices out there, we try and push to the crowds first, and these stories flounder because they don't have any traction within um, you know, our peers and our tribes. So we often talk about, um, before you want to get these stories out there to the wider crowd, you need to have the, you know, the buy-in, the support, um, and the investment from those inner circles first to give these stories legitimacy. You know, why aren't this, or isn't this organization's peers listening to them? Um, that's what the crowd will ask if your peers aren't behind you first. So you move from your peers to your tribes and your crowds and you try and push your stories out that way rather than trying to just reach them out into the crowds where they will have, you know, they just, yeah, won't have any authenticity to them. The important thing I think is you don't need to have a really large platform to do that and I think that's where the peers um, the piece that we're talking about is really, really important. Um, I'm not sure if anyone remembers when um, the cricketer Philip Hughes died and the, the put out your bats um, hashtag that, that went around the world, trended in I think seven or eight different countries. So that all started with a guy in Adelaide called Paul Taylor who had 14 followers um, who just thought it was a nice thing to do. And you know, within 24 hours it was like Viv Richards and Billy Bragg and this kind of stuff. Sachin Tendulkar had, had jumped onto it. So you know, if, if, the, if the, I think if, if the sentiment is authentic and um, you know, people actually believe what you're saying, they're much more likely to buy into it than, than they are through, a, through you know, something that's, that's, you know, that, doesn't, that doesn't smell right. I don't think we ask. We do a lot of telling. We do a lot of, hey, look at this terrible thing that's going on. Or look at these horrible budget cuts that we're being, having foisted upon us. Or look at this issue that's big at the moment. We don't have an ask that we're getting, we're telling people that we want them to do. And sometimes when we do have an ask, they're weak. They're soft asks. They're, sign my petition. Send a letter to an MP. You know, and some of this stuff, I think, isn't the most useful way. And we need to think about how we actually create impactful ways for people to contribute to the campaigns that we're working on. It's actually American research, but we do find with a lot of the research we do, when we replicate it in Australia, it's, it's, it can be quite similar um, in terms of the figures that we get. Um, what we found is overarching, overarchingly Twitter users are charitable. Um, and so the statistics we got from this research, 96% of Twitter users have donated to a charity in the last 12 months, or at the very least they tell us they have. Um, one, in two users, one in two of our users actually follow a charity account on Twitter. So really got opportunities there, you know, for people to engage because they are, they are looking for this type of stuff on Twitter. 84% um, of our users have retweeted a charity, 68% have visited a charity site um, from a tweet that they've seen, um, and just over half have donated having seen a tweet. Um, which that figure is, um, you know, even though we don't actually have a donate now function on Twitter, um, it's really great that people are actually following through on some of that stuff. Um, we don't talk about target markets, we talk about target moments. 
Um, and so it could be anything from, you know, really a really big event like the Cricket World Cup or, um, you know, the Netball World, World Cup that's coming up. Um, but there are also everyday moments. So every single day we see spikes at exactly the same time. So uh, people talk about commutes at the same time every day, in the morning and in the evening. There are three big spikes during the day where people talk about they're hungry. Pretty much the same time of night, every, every single night, there's either someone saying they're tired, there's a lot of people saying they're tired, or there's people saying that they can't sleep. So there are, there are really common um, patterns in conversation that occur at pretty predictable times that um, you, know, you can actually capture people when they're, when, when they're in a certain mindset. TV is probably a really, really big one. Um, so you know, the, the, the whole second screen thing around television. So if there is, if there is something on, on TV that is in any way corresponds to the issue that you're trying to raise awareness of, that can be a really great way to capture people in joining in on that TV conversation. One really simple thing that I've found is that often the next day's news stories, the next day's paper news stories will be online by about 9, 9.30. And if you go there and you tweet that story or tweet something about that story uh, from the organisation account, often that will be the major tweet about that thing that then runs right throughout the next day. That I do that all the time and it's, really, it's just a really useful way of reminding people that you're there. Yeah, and the other thing is don't remember that, um, you know, thinking offline is your, your radio news producers for breakfast radio, they'll be checking those tweets really uh, late at night or early in the morning. You know, they'll be going through the headlines, they might go through and search for the, the search terms or the hashtags around that and if you, um, it's a great point, if you're one of the ones who is first out there talking about it, then you might be more likely to get the call the next day to, to chat on radio. What are the key things that we should be doing to make sure that we're telling the right stories and what are the th and what should we avoid? Yeah, um, I'd just like to go back to the question that was asked a little bit earlier about how do you make, you know, your social media actually have longevity as a campaign. And basically, I mean, tying your social media into what is actually going on in your organisation. And if you have a campaign, the campaign doesn't begin when the campaign begins. The campaign begins before that. Get your audience engaged with the campaign before it begins so they feel like they're helping you build that campaign. That becomes their campaign then. When that's tied into something in the real world, they feel like you know, they're putting that first brick down in the, in the building that's getting built. They feel like that's their project. And in that way, every single update that happens on that project is something engaging for them. You know, it could be something as small as, you know, the first brick being put down or something. You know, you, it might be, you know, meeting somebody or something. Every single update becomes a piece of content that is engaging and interesting for them because this becomes their campaign. So I guess the, the takeaway from that long-winded answer is that, yeah, you have to, it's their campaign. You can't be, you know, um, yeah, really kind of tight and really stranglehold with the ownership over the campaign. You have to let it free, let it out into the audience and let it go, let it breathe. Thanks, Matt. Two points. One is don't forget the human side of any activism. We all remember Get Coney. It felt good retweeting, but it didn't have any practicality on the ground, so the human element's still very important and that generally comes through events. And the other is data. Data, I think, is very, very important in setting context. For me, there's three main things is that we, you know, we talked about authenticity, which is really important. I think we talked about that a lot. Um, engagement is really important as well. So make sure, you know, if you're on social media, you're actually talking to people. If people are talking to you, talk back to them. Um, don't be afraid to ask people for, for something, and whether that's, a, a, that's anything from a donation or their time down to, a, a, you know, as simple as a retweet or a share. Um, and um, I completely forgot what the last thing was. No, make, make sure you know what you're asking for. Like, I think you need to be really clear in your ask and don't make it convoluted. So it needs to be a really, a really simple action that someone can take that's going to actually help you achieve your objective. So, you know, if there's a way you can synthesise that down into a hashtag or a picture or, you know, a simple call to action, um, if people can walk away and remember knowing what you want from them, that, that's going to really cut through a lot better. Truthiness reigns supreme and we need to find ways and think about ways that we come back to capturing some kind of public spirit to rise up against this stuff. And I think we can do it if we start to do it together. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming along, Natasha O'Keefe, Patrick Skeen, Nathan Berman, and give a round of applause, everyone. Thank you.